Well, good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the latest in a series of MTS Together events. And we are very glad to be hosting the second Classics related MTS Together event. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Philip Harris and I'm head of Classics here. It's great to see um, a series of guests this evening. We've got some OMTs here, we've got current pupils, and we have plenty of parents as well, and pupils from local schools. And we're delighted to be joined this evening by Dr. John Kitmer, himself a classist, and he's going to be sharing with us some perspectives on his career as a diplomat. And then after he's spoken, he'll be taking some questions from some current pupils as well. So without further ado, um, John, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Philip, great, thank you. Um, thank you for the kind words and thank you for the invitation. It's uh, always nice to be um, asked to speak about um, one's career and particularly nice to uh, talk about the role played in classics, by uh, played by classics in it. I think I'm perhaps unusual in that um, I can reasonably claim to be a classicist um, whose career trajectory was um, influenced more than most by the fact that I had done classics. And my career was certainly not hurt by having uh, done classics both uh, as a school pupil and then as a student uh, at university. So for all of uh, the students um, watching tonight, my message I hope is going to be one of uh, cheer and hope. Uh, you can have uh, good general um, and even specialist careers um, having done uh, studies uh, either at school or at university or both uh, in classics. I'm going to speak for about 15, um, maybe 20 minutes if I get carried away, um, taking you through uh, bits of my career. I want you to, at the end of this, have some sense of what my career looked like, my professional career, and also what role classics uh, played in it at, at different points. Um, I should say, perhaps at the start, that my professional career ended um, a few years ago, five years ago, when I decided to leave the public service in order to finish off a PhD, which I finished um, in 2019. And since I uh, finished uh, the PhD, I've been doing a number of different things. I am a non-executive director on a Greek shipping business, um, a big Greek shipping business. Um, I run a couple of small charities, which I will give you a bit of information about at the end of the talk. Uh, and I'm doing my academic writing, uh, uh, which arises partly uh, from uh, the PhD that I finished in 2019. Um, so my the professional career I'm going to talk about this evening um, finished um, a few years ago. But this enables you to see, I think, how you can uh, build a career on the back of classics. I was uh, a civil servant and a diplomat for just, uh, just about 24 years in total. Okay, let us um, go through. Let me see if this will work. Um, it won't. Let me try again. Here we go. So... Why learn classics? I'm not going to give you some general answers to this because you'll all have your own answers as to why you are learning classics, intend to learn classics, or have done some classics. I just want to talk a little bit about why I took this course. First and foremost, I did it for the very simple reason uh, that I had to. Um, we were taught um, Latin compulsorily from the age of 11 to 16, and we had no real choice about it. Um, we were taught in a very traditional way, which is uh, very rarely taught these days, using these uh, classic books as I've <laughs> put in front of you. Um, uh, uh, for me, I have kind of fell in love with it. Um, I uh, adored two subjects, really, from the age of 11 onwards. Um, one was Latin and one was maths. And I guess I uh, liked them both for fairly similar reasons, combination of um, structure, complexity, elegance, um, the fact that you were expected to solve problems while also learning uh, uh, complicated uh, shapes and forms and structures. 
Um, so Latin had always, uh, from the moment I started it, really, uh, really appealed to me. Um, I picked up uh, Greek. I started to do Greek um, at the age of 14. I took the decision to do so um, when I was 13. I had decided as a boy that I was going to become an Anglican priest. And for me, the point of doing Latin and Greek uh, was to understand the sacred languages. Um, I also intended at a subsequent point when I got to university to do Hebrew. Um, so I had a very, very specific career goal, even from the age of 12 and 13, which underpinned um, my um, choices, uh, my choice to do Greek on top of uh, Latin. Um, unusual choices, perhaps, but not ones that turned out to be career limiting. Um, I was very fortunate when I was 16, and this is me, age 16, rather a lot thinner than I am now, and quite a lot more hair. Um, I was very lucky when I was 16 that I was taken to Greece um, as part of a, a lower sixth form trip. It was the first time I'd ever been to the country. It was 19. 84 and I completely fell in love with the country I um, thought it was very beautiful the landscapes the seascapes um, I was very fortunate in that the uh, guy doing the tour uh, was my principal Greek master who was not only stupendously well informed about the ancient world uh, he also spoke fluent modern Greek um, and knew about Byzantium too so he was a perfect guide to you know, what we call the diachronic history of Greece, the history of Greece through the ages. And he kind of exposed the country to us through uh, its monuments um, and uh, the places of battle at sea and at, uh, at land, but also by exposing us to modern Greece. Perhaps modern Greece is a bit different now from uh, what it was like in the 70s and the 80s before the single market took effect. But it, it really felt like a very um, Eastern country. It didn't feel like Western Europe in the early 80s. Um, and uh, for me, I just thought it was astonishing. We had the great pleasure of spending Easter in 1984 on the island of Aegina. Um, and for me, planning to become a priest, um, to watch a whole community celebrate Easter together was kind of magical. And it really, really convinced me that I was uh, taking uh, the right course of action, that I really should uh, go to university and uh, study classics there. So that's the important message. And I'm not just joking. I think classics is about love. There's no earthly reason why you should learn Latin or Greek. You can, if you want to understand the structures of Indo-European languages, you can learn French or German or Russian or whatever. Um, there's all sorts of different ways into learning history as well and philosophy um, and broader culture too. Um, but classics is uh, marked by being a, a very, very, specifically bound discipline with lots of different aspects to it. And I think that successful classicists, we all fall in love with it, maybe not the totality, but with specific aspects of it. So um, love, I think, is one of the reasons why you should uh, want to read classics, enjoy doing classics, and also not worry too much about what's going to happen after you cease studying classics, as most of us do at some point, uh, cease to be formal students. So the outlines of my classical career, my career actually as a classicist, as I said, I did uh, the, the school basics. I did my O-levels and my A-levels in classical Greek and uh, Latin and lots of other things too. But those are the two things that I really wanted to do. Um, I then, um, uh, talking to the people who were guiding me through the early thinking about a, a vocation as a priest, decided to go to Cambridge um, to, to do classics initially for part one. The course is very flexible um, to do classics for part one and then to move either to theology or to Hebrew uh, for the remaining year or two years, depending on what I fancied, uh, fancied doing. In the end, um, actually, I got so hooked on the classics that um, I decided to 
uh, to do part two uh, of the tripos as well. And my ideas about becoming a priest, I kind of put uh, to what turned out to be a very, uh, a very distant side. Um, so I became even more um, hooked on the classics than I was actually by uh, studying them as an undergraduate. And I did my three years at Cambridge. 1987, 88, I was wondering what to do. And I had two ideas. The first was to uh, apply for the Foreign Office uh, because I fancied traveling the world, using my language skills, learning modern languages um, and, le and using the transferable skills, which I was fairly confident I'd picked up. Um, and I sat and passed the uh, exam for the diplomatic service in 1987, 1988. Um, but I decided in the end to go on to do postgrad studies, and I started immediately a, a DPhil uh, at Oxford, um, researching into classical uh, uh, Greek tragedy and comedy uh, with reference to other types of, uh, of lyric genre. Um, I worked on that for five years. I never finished it. It never will be finished, but it really did um, uh, influence um, most of the rest of my life because I learned to awful lot from what I did there. Um, uh, after my funding, my three-year funding ran out uh, at the end of 1991, I got a college lectureship in classics at Brasenose College and taught uh, language and literature at uh, for honor mods at Oxford and then uh, teaching um, some of the literature papers for classical greats. Uh, specializing, of course, in tragedy and comedy, but also some of the Roman poets that I liked, like Ovid. So I did that for a year and then had a cluster of um, uh, tutorial, uh, not really positions, but tutorial responsibilities for Brasenose uh, and for Lady Margaret Hall and Maudlin. So I did an awful lot of teaching uh, of the classics, which I hugely enjoyed, and I made a bit of progress with my uh, DPhil as well. But at the end of it, I kind of thought, well, I've now been doing this for eight years. I want to go and do things. And I was very convinced that uh, at the end of these eight years, first as an undergraduate and then as a postgraduate and as a college lecturer, that I had picked up marketable skills that would be of real use uh, in the real world. And I thought hard about what those skills might be and where I might uh, apply. And I applied to private companies. I got a couple of job offers uh, to train um, on the accountancy side of multinational businesses. But I took um, the offer which I thought would appeal to my skills and interests most, which was um, uh, in the fast stream of the home civil service. Um, by the time I applied in 1993, 1992, 1993, I'd got really interested in domestic politics and European politics, particularly around labor law, around um, employment and social rights. Um, I was very interested in uh, the huge political disputes between the major government um, and his own party and the opposition around the Maastricht Treaty. Um, and I was, uh, of course, particularly interest, interested in, uh, given my, what then became my subsequent career, in um, the employment and social chapters, which were controversial in 1992 and then again in 1997. So I decided, having got through the Fast Dream entrance process, the exam, and then the two stages of interviews, um, to get into the employment department, and they took me. Um, and that was the um, base of my career. I spent five years in the employment department, which merged, merged with education uh, in 1995, but five years in uh, the employment department and then its merged entity. And then I got posted to uh, the Foreign Office in Brussels to uh, be the negotiator on labor law and education and discrimination law. Um, and at the end of that, came back to the Foreign Office to do various things in London. Um, I then hopped sidewards, as it were, to um, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs um, and worked there for eight years, um, in the middle of which I spent two years in the Cabinet Office on a secondment. Um, I then had had um, enough of being at home and wanted to go overseas and got back into the Foreign Office. 
um, having been appointed to Athens. Um, and after that, I came back and did about nine months in the in the foreign office at the end of that. So I had a sort of fairly varied career. I, I didn't want to become a deep specialist in anything. I wanted to become a generalist whose um, skills would enable him to be effective in different parts of the government service. And that carried me from one place to another over 24 years. And I think pretty successfully. I mean, here are my career highlights. Here are the things that, frankly, people always want to ask me about and talk to, talk to me about. I worked with ministers very closely as the private secretary and then the principal private secretary, first to a junior minister and then the secretary of state at the, um, or, uh, I was principal private secretary in the environment department. Um, I was a first secretary in the UK permanent representation to the European Union in Brussels, working as a negotiator on employment, labor law, social policy and education. Um, then the two um, posts which, which I ended my career were ambassador to Athens and then commissioner of the British Indian Ocean Territory and the British Antarctic Territory. Um, so I think I had um, a pretty good career and uh, none of this, you might think, bears enormous relationship to having studied classics. Um, so the variety of what I was able to do um, uh, proves something both about what you learn by doing a classics degree and learning it at school and what you then must do to orientate yourself towards a professional career. So what work skills did classics give me? I'm not going to take you through all of this list. I mean, I've tried to put down um, in reasonably sharp analytical form the things I think that my um, school education in classics, my undergraduate, my postgraduate education in classics gave me. Some of it will be blindingly obvious. A, a British ambassador to Greece has to speak Greek. Um, really from the age of 16 and falling in love with Greece, I started to learn the modern Greek language as well, first by being told how to apply some rules of pronunciation and grammar and syntax to the ancient language to transfer it into some simple expressions in modern Greek and then uh, applying myself much more systematically to the proper learning of the, the modern language. So that's kind of obvious. It is easier to learn modern Greek if you have uh, classical Greek. Um, and I know that from watching members of my own family um, learn modern Greek from scratch. It's much easier uh, to do so if you have a background in classical Greek. Uh, of all of these things, I mean, some of them, as I say, you probably would expect, and I wouldn't make claims that all of them are specific to classics. Any humanities degree worth its salt with a degree of um, technical uh, expertise required, such as you have in the manipulation of a foreign language, um, should give you some, all of the, some, perhaps all of these skills. What I do think a classics education gives you is, um, which is important, is a basic degree of curiosity. Most classicists are people who are interested um, about the present and the past and the way in which um, signs of the past remain present in the landscape, in our cultural lives, in what we read, in our lexicon, in the vocabulary that we use to describe medical terms or, or, or whatever. We, we have the sense that the world that we live is um, in somehow layered and we ought to try and understand, uh, we understand that. Um, particularly if we've studied the history of the classical world as it becomes the Christian world, the Byzantine world, and then the fragmented states of medieval Europe. Again, we have a sense of uh, the deep play of the processes of history and what leads to change, whether a revolutionary instantaneous change or the, the slow processes uh, of um, evolutionary change. Curiosity really matters. If you're going to go into a professional career that isn't um, grounded or directly related to what you studied as an undergraduate, curiosity and imaginative interest in 
other disciplines is absolutely essential. And I do think that classics gives you that. I learned a lot about team working and leadership from general university activities. As I've said, I, um, I taught for a, a couple of years pretty intensively and learned a lot uh, about myself um, and my students. Um, uh, through that, how you bring other people on. It's not all about you, it's about your team. Are you really uh, finding out what's best about them and helping them? Um, I did a lot of um, coxing and coaching rowing aids when I was at university over eight years as well. And though I spent quite a lot of time thinking it was all trivial and a great distraction from finishing my DPhil, actually in terms of um, getting into a job and convincing people I knew how to uh, bring people on, forge them into teams, um, get them winning. Um, it was uh, useful. So do not forget when you're at university to, to use all of the ancillary opportunities that you have um, to, uh, to pick up transferable skills. Classics isn't the be all and end all of life, of course. And if you go into a professional career, you have to have strategies for covering the gaps. And I think you usually, by the time you've got into a career, have had in many interviews and exams and whatnot, and you've thought pretty hard about what it is you're going to do, how you're going to position yourself. Um, your technical knowledge will require constant investment. Um, to my very last post as a highfalutin director in the Foreign Office, I still prepared for it in the classic way of uh, going to people's talks, um, asking, uh, academic experts to talk to me uh, about the field, reading books. You should never, never not read books if you want to become a technical expert in a discipline that you're uh, not familiar with. So um, applying yourself to the acquisition of technical knowledge is obviously going to be important. And I've listed some of the things that I set out to become expert in. Um, I think I genuinely did become expert in labor law, particularly European labor law, um, and could hold my own with lawyers and practitioner experts, um, certainly at the end of the, the time that I'd been negotiating. On other areas, I learned enough to be effective uh, in the job. Operational skills, some of these are sort of softer, your leadership and man management skills how processes work around you, how to do risk and crisis management, how to start becoming aware of yourself as somebody who is operating in a complex workplace uh, and not just doing your own thing. Uh, there's lots of help out there to help you and most employers of any scale will try to help you by putting you on decent courses and giving you diagnostic tools. But that sense of how to grow yourself and develop a career you won't have when you start your career, but um, any good organization will help you put in place the building blocks uh, for taking yourself forward within an organization or indeed out of it so that you can uh, move, uh, move around as you age and grow. Networking is also hugely important. I think it's more common to talk about it now than it was when I started, um, but how to maintain contacts that will help you in the here and now and then throughout your career it's hugely hugely important um so i i mean i tried really from the start to think in broad conceptual terms about what sort of career in the public service i wanted and how to use the different aspects of my interests and skills and knowledge um, and I tried to pool things into different areas. I tried to gain some forms of generic experience. I tried to gain expertise in particular um, subject disciplines. And I also tried to um, find specific areas of technique where all government departments were looking for that sort of te technique. And this is what I... Um, developed over about, took me about 10 years to come up with this full set of things which I had um, created and which became the sort of building blocks of a career. So I started quite basically in the employment department, making sure 
that I was genuinely capable of sounding like and being an expert in this subject area. And that sustained me really for the, the first decade of my career. I was very keen to get into parliamentary and political work. I've always been a political junkie. Um, I've always um, watched politics very closely. Uh, I always wanted to be close to the political action. Of course, civil servants and diplomats are politically neutral, but you can get close to uh, ministers if you choose certain career paths within the public service. And I was very keen to work on parliamentary legislation, secondary regulations, and the political work of actually sustaining the political lives of ministers um, in their departments as private secretaries uh, and so on. Um, I very much wanted to become an expert in the European Union. It was always a building block for me. It was at the back of pretty much most of my career. I'm therefore one of the people, I'm not going to moan about this, but I'm one of the people whose careers were basically mutilated by the decision uh, that the British people took in 2016 because uh, the bulk of my career was um, around um, multilateral expertise in the European Union. Crisis management was also something that appealed to me. Um, I quite like long, slow burning projects. Uh, the part-time PhD I started late in life took me 11 years of uh, long slog. Um, so I can do long slog projects that go slowly, but actually in work I was best when I was dealing with immediate problems, getting down to solving them, um, working with teams around me. I liked that and I liked the adrenaline buzz of that. And I realized that quite quickly and did a lot of crisis management and tended to get pulled into crisis management uh, sorts of work. But I never gave up on the classics. I never ever wanted to stop um, thinking about and doing Greek things. And when I started uh, my career in 1993, I was continuing work on my PhD. I did four years more work on it in the British Library late at night, most evenings. Um, I published a piece, a couple of, um, couple of uh, review pieces as well. Um, and then from 2002, 2005 onwards, um, I started to do part-time study in modern Greek to position myself to get jobs with the Foreign Office in Greece at some point in the future. Um, so I looked for uh, departments that would enable me to do that. And I found in DEFRA and in the Cabinet Office departments that would allow me to do um, various forms of part-time work at various times, never always, never more than for a few months, but both those departments enabled me to work four days a week um, at periods uh, when it was possible in the jobs that I was doing. And this was largely on the back of the move to more flexible work. So career highlights. This is my boring list, though this is the serious list. These are the four things that I'm really proud of that I did, um, that I led the teams doing these. Uh, they were good things, um, it made a difference. Um, I can bore for Britain about these subjects, um, but these are the four things that were my career highlights in terms of actual outputs and outcomes in one or two of those cases. But here is the more sort of sexy, glamorous um, visual version of that. Uh, Parliament, I just love being in Parliament. Um, in this picture here, where Sunak is on his feet on what's called the Treasury bench, the front bench of the government, with Johnson sitting, um, looking, well, you can <laughs> guess what his expression is. Um, but the civil servants sit up at number five, and there's room for about five or six of you. Um, and the civil servant at the end is usually in charge. Uh, and the civil service team um, is um, helping the minister on the front bench and all sorts of different debates from legislative debates to adjournment debates, which used to happen extremely late at night or sometimes early in the morning. Um, and it's politics at its most um, immediate. You are there, your minister may be falling over, may need your advice, you need to get the answer down pretty quickly in a form that she or he 
can use. I adored it. I did three parliamentary bills as the bill manager that I took through Parliament. I was there in the adjournment debate late at night. Um, uh, I did first for questions for the department on many occasions. It was tremendous fun. Um, it's one of those things I still have dreams about and the occasional nightmare. I met the Queen um, as her ambassador. Um, uh, it was astonishing, really. Um, yeah, it was really astonishing. I, uh, of course, um, knew that I would get the honor of a private audience, um, uh, but uh, yeah, it was, ah, well, she was an extraordinary person and she was incredibly well briefed when she talked to her ambassadors and just an amazing person. She was full of life and humor. She made you laugh. You were always very nervous uh, and she was rather fantastic. So without getting too weepy about the queen, um, meeting her was definitely one of my highlights, but this, so ambassador in Greece, where do the red arrows train um, in those miserable months where Lincolnshire is just full of rain and the clouds, are, uh, the skies are full of clouds? Well, they train in Greece. And uh, so that your job as the ambassador is to help them get all of the permissions uh, for their partnership with the Greek Air Force. And in my final year of uh, four years of helping them do this, they said, do you want a ride? So I had a ride with them. That's me in the back of a two seater. You'd be glad to hear that there was actually a pilot in front. And this is us. That's two planes. And that was me actually at that point feeling not too hot after we turned the full, uh, the full circle up in the air. Completely fantastic. I was up in the air with them for about um, 20, 25 minutes and uh, completely unforgettable, wholly unrelated to classics, except who would have thought that learning Amo Amas Amat would end with a ride with the Red Arrows? I don't think that's bad. What would I do quickly? differently very quickly I spent an hour today trying to think of sort of lessons uh, of how I would do diff things differently actually I enjoyed my career enormously and I think it went okay um, uh, don't do a, an MA before you do a DPhil would be my message I think it's almost impossible to do that these days be imaginative when you do an MA you don't have to do classics MA do something different um, that widens your horizons and then think about going on and do a, doing a DPhil um, don't do things in a hurry. I think my uh, last job was taken in a bit of a hurry. I should have um, looked around for a bit longer. I should have been a better networker. I'm not, I wasn't great at that. It took me a long time to become good at it. I was best when I was overseas as a networker in Brussels and Athens. Um, and make sure when you are learning finan uh, uh, professional skills, finance, negotiating, um, all are human resources, all of these other things um, that you do constantly bolster them and have them accredited. It really matters if you're going to move between jobs. That's the end of me. Here are a couple of things to note. So I said at the start, I'm running a couple of charities. Uh, you can follow the tweets that I do on them, the Anglo-Hellenic League and then the Gilbert Murray Trust. I do a blog. I've been a bit lazy this year, but I'm just about to, uh, to write something. Um, my academic work continues. Um, a book comes out next year to which I've um, written what the Greeks would call a scientific introduction, an academic uh, introduction to a new volume of poetry. Um, classics has really given me lots and lots of opportunities. I've done astonishing things that nobody in my family in all its generations have done. And this is down to having done classics having gained an enormous passion for Greece, for languages, for culture, for traveling, for seeing things, for talking to people um, and building a career on that. So thank you. Philip, over to you. John, thank you very much for that. That was absolutely fantastic um, overview of your, your career. Thanks so much. And um, we're going to get some questions from some uh, current pupils in a moment. But before we do that, John, I just wonder if you could give us a quick, very quick sense. Um, I'm sure many of us have an idea of ambassadors, um, mainly from watching uh, for Forever Roche adverts and the like. <laughs> Um, could, could you just give us a brief sense of what, what's the day in the life of, of, a, of the ambassador to Greece like? What are you doing? Yes. No, yeah. it's a good question. So you're juggling three things, 
almost every day because the work um, is in sort of three basic categories. Um, in a country like Greece, where you have about three million British tourists every year, you have a big consular operation. So looking after British people who've got themselves into various forms of difficulty, either through acts of foolishness or just through accident, accident and happenstance, looking after British tourists is um, uh, the job of the consular team, uh, but almost always involves uh, the ambassador if, it go, if something big has gone wrong. Um, so I, all, I tended to get involved in all of the big uh, the, the big problem, somebody being murdered, somebody being raped, um, somebody being thrown into prison for reasons unknown, all, all of this sort of thing. So helping British citizens overseas is uh, part of it. The second um, area is um, flogging stuff, um, selling um, British uh, goods and services overseas, and um, depending on the targets, attracting investment from um, your overseas, po overseas post into the UK. So getting, uh, getting investors uh, to invest in the UK. And um, that's a big part of what happens even, um, so I was in Greece in years of economic crisis, but we were still operating to, to flog things. There were still things uh, that the Greek government and others um, wanted to buy off the UK. Um, so helping out with that process. Uh, and then the third area, um, which tends to be, which tends to gravitate more to the ambassador, um, is handling the politics and the diplomacy and the security aspects of the job. Uh, so managing a political team, a defense team. Um, we had various police teams as well. Um, uh, if you have... Um, uh, MI6 in your embassy dealing with the uh, the station uh, as well and uh, through that political work working with the Greek government in my case uh, working with NGOs in Greece um, getting to know people making sure that you know all of the the, the, the movers and shakers and that's where the Ferrero Rocher comes in though I have to say it was never offered in my embassy. Thank you very much. Um, John, we're going to go now to one of our current sixth formers, um, and this is Harry Nolan, who is currently studying Greek and Latin in Lower Sixth. Harry, do you have a question to ask? Hello. Um, what are your thoughts on the news that uh, a deal concerning the Parthenon marbles could be reached in the near future between the UK and Greece? Great. Hi, Harry. Tell me a bit about yourself. Are you studying Greek, Latin, ancient history? What's what's you doing? Uh, I'm doing Greek, Latin, and English literature. Fantastic. Yeah. Very good. Well, good good luck with that. Are you in the lower sixth, the upper sixth? Uh, lower sixth. Lower sixth. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Well, enjoy it and uh, 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 and make the most of it. Um, read around. Read read lots. It's uh, that was the combination that I did in the sixth form as well. And I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, the Parthenon sculptures. Um, okay. Um, first, I think it's really good that the British Museum and the Greek government are talking. Um, Greece and Britain don't have many bilateral problems, problems between them at the level of, of state. Um, in reality, the Parthenon sculptures isn't a huge bilateral problem. It doesn't get in the way of uh, normal bilateral relations between the two countries, but it's a sort of piece of grit uh, in the oyster uh, of the relationship. So as a diplomat, I always kind of hoped it would go away or wanted uh, to be the person that might solve the, uh, solve the, the problem. Um, it is quite a big problem in the sense that when you have two countries or two institutions or two people um, who stand at odds over something and have been at odds for it for, in this case, over 200 years, it's quite hard to solve these problems because both sides have usually 
by the point that they finally sit down to talk, have painted themselves into various corners. Um, bilateral um, problems in negotiation always, or 99% of times, I guess, require compromise. So the process that you set up to create that compromise, to identify that compromise, really matters. There are lots of techniques for how you do this. Um, there are lots of experts to help um, bilateral negotiating parties do this, do this effectively. I have to say I slightly groaned when I saw um, this go public because that's not usually a good sign um, that one side or other or both have leaked something to the press. That's not usually going to help. Um, I think this will be difficult to solve, but, you know, we're not talking a matter of war. This is not a, 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 this is not a truly, truly horrendous bilateral problem. It's something which ought to be soluble with a bit of goodwill um, and some imagination and, and on both sides, uh, a sense of compromise. Um, so I would say I'm... I'm I'm not optimistic, but I'm also not pessimistic about this. I think it's good that um, talks appear to be uh, appear to be underway. But you tell me, what's 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 your view on this? What do you what do you want to happen? Um, I I don't really know if there's an obvious answer either. Ah, uh, you're more of a diplomat than I am. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Harry is well used to being put on the spot rather than fairly by me in my lessons, so I think uh, he'll, he'll be getting plenty of that in the in the coming days. But <laughs> Harry, thank you very much for, for the you. question. Yeah. Um, I think Alex Sakrani, who's also in lower six. Um, Alex, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Um, yes. Hi. Uh, what do you think Hello. is the relevance uh, and what do you think the future is for the British overseas territories? Uh, Hi, nice to nice to meet you. Uh, are you also a classicist? Yes, I'm doing Latin history and English literature. Very good. And why your interest in the British Overseas Territories, which I applaud, of course. But uh... <laughs> I just think, well, I know they have very close relationships with Britain, and I wasn't too sure what those relationships entailed and like how we use them, how we mm -hmm. use those relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a very, it's a Good question, and it's um, it's also a, a big question. Um, so, I mean, the future of the British Indian, uh, the future of the British overseas territories as a whole, depends um, mostly on the people who live in the territories. Um, there are a dozen inhabited territories, um, some in the Caribbean, just north of Bermuda, just north of the Caribbean. Um, some in the mid-Atlantic um, down to the South Atlantic. Um, all of those are inhabited um, and their um, populations in most cases have their own governments um, set up by statutes in Westminster. So they elect their own leaders. Um, their governments are Her Majesty's governments, um, just as the government in Westminster is. Um, and it's long been accepted uh, that in those inhabited territories, uh, the future of um, uh, the mostly islands, um, all islands, um, uh, as British overseas territories depends on what the people want. Um, in the Caribbean, most of the former British overseas territories have over the years elected uh, to have full independence um, at least, uh, usually initially sharing uh, the British monarch as the head of state, then maybe creating a, a republic and uh, electing a local president. And that's always open uh, to all of the um, overseas territories that have inhabitants. If they decided that they wanted to be independent uh, of the UK, uh, they, uh, they would be uh, allowed to become independent. Um, there are lots of reasons why those who remain with us do remain with us. Um, in some cases, um, they um, fear existential threats, um, as they do in the Falkland Islands. In some other cases, they're probably not viable 
uh, without the sort of help that they get from the UK. That's true, I think, of Ascension and St. Helena. It's probably true of Montserrat as well, which is highly dependent on development aid. Um, uh, so there are good reasons in some cases where it would be unlikely that you'd see the inhabitants asking for independence from the UK. On the Caribbean islands, um, I kind of think it depends. It depends what they. It depends what they want. Um, uh, they don't usually like pressure from the UK interfering in their affairs as they see it. Um, pressure from the UK is more likely to uh, push uh, push them towards independence than not. I guess. We also have two uninhabited territories: the British Antarctic Territory uh, and the British Indian Ocean Territory both of which are um, governed by a commissioner resident in London. That was the post that I had at the end of my career. And the British Antarctic, um, uh, we have a territorial claim, which like the claims of others is managed through the British Antarctic Treaty. Um, really, it's important for us in terms of science. Uh, so the British Antarctic Survey is down there doing um, permanent science year on year out is very important, it's based in Cambridge. Um, they do very exciting science, of course, they're all over climate change, as you would expect at the moment. The other territory is more complicated, the British Indian Ocean Territory, uh, the Chagos Archipelago. Um, it's a sort of island paradise um, uh, from which we expelled the population in the 1960s and the 1970s to create an enormous joint military base with the US. Uh, that decision is now contested by the government of Mauritius, who got support on a non-binding agreement from the International Court of Justice uh, two or three years back. Um, so in that case, um, uh, the UK government and the government of Mauritius will sit down and talk shortly um, about contesting sovereignty claims. But this comes into the same category as the pardon on sculptures, but on a bigger scale. It's a huge bilateral, in this case, a huge bilateral um, problem uh, that um, I think will be difficult to resolve. So it's kind of complicated, but if you want to know more, do what Simon Winchester did and get yourself around all of the inhabited territories. That's that's easily possible. You can, of course, also get to the British Antarctic these days through um, cruises and the like. They're, they're rather expensive. Uh, the British Indian Ocean Territory, you'll find it hard to get on uh, on that territory. If you do get onto it without permission, you'll soon be escorted off by Royal Marines or the US Navy. <laughs> good, good to know. <laughs> Thank you for that, John. Thanks. And we've got one final question, um, and that's from Marcello Caronti. Over to you, Marcello. And hello. Um, are you optimistic about the future prosperity of Greece, um, given the crisis of 10 years ago? Hi, Marcello. Are you an economist in the making? No, I take um, Greek and, and Latin for, for, I bring it to GCSE, yeah. I take it. Right. Very good. I, I would say that um, that doesn't rule out economics at some point later in, uh, in your uh, professional career. Um, I spent a lot of time learning um, the fundamentals of macroeconomics and particularly labor market economics. Um, I have to say what I did learn helped me enormously when I went to Greece, um, the problems of which I followed pretty closely from 2008 onwards. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, I am um, optimistic about um, the Greek situation um, for all sorts of slightly different reasons. I mean, first, uh, the banking system has been stabilized and put on a sustainable footing. Um, that was one of the big uh, efforts of the three memoranda to get the banking system stable uh, and secure again. Um, the banking system was, um, by 2015, um, in charge of, loosely speaking, a huge number of what they call NPLs, non-performing loans. And this, um, um, uh, propor the proportion of loans that were unlikely uh, to be repaid um, had become a really unsustainable 
uh, proportion of the total. I think it was about 40% for some of the banks. So part of the rescue and the bailout was about um, helping the banks deal with the non-performing loans, creating what they call bad banks to isolate um, those assets, to flog them off uh, uh, in different ways to investors who will take high risk products. Um, so that work has been underway for a number of years and has helped stabilize the banking system. In terms of the sovereign, uh, the Greek state itself, um, which had also got itself in a position um, by 2010 that it could no longer borrow because it couldn't uh, afford the interest rates that the international markets insisted on. Um, that position has also been stabilized through the intervention of the three memorandums of understanding between uh, the three institutions, the lending, uh, the big multilateral lending institutions, and uh, the Greek government. As a result of this, um, uh, quite a lot of the debt was simply written off. Uh, the rest of the debt, which has to be paid off, uh, will be paid off over uh, a reasonable period of time. And certainly over the next 10 years, um, there should be no cause for alarm. The Greek state should be able to uh, meet its debt repayments over the next 10 years. Um, and of course, in the interim, we hope that the Greek economy will grow so that as uh, debt repayments increase um, after this sort of grace period, uh, things, uh, things remain sustainable. Um, Greece needs to grow and to fall to find new sources of growth. Its tourist product needs to change. I think there's every sign that that's happening. Uh, the tourist season in Greece is now much longer. Uh, you can go on a holiday in Greece in October. I can assure you when I was a teenager, that was not true. Everything closed down on the 2nd or the 3rd of September. Um, but now you can go into October. And of course, if you stay longer, um, uh, they're, they're happier still. Um, of course, they're looking for the higher end of the tourist um, industry as well. So there's a huge casino and development, uh, casino and um, hotel and landscaping development um, just south of Athens on the plain, uh, which should help them as well. And they're looking to diversify across the economy into high tech. They've been doing their best to attract people like Microsoft um, and others to come and bring high tech jobs because lots of Greeks have skills. I mean, there's an absolute uh, passion for higher education uh, in Greece. It's taken really seriously. Um, but there haven't always been the opportunities. And so creating those opportunities through diversification is, uh, is also important. Um, so, you know, I'm predicting the future is always uh, really, really hard, particularly at the moment, the world is in a pretty, uh, pretty difficult place. But I think Greece is looking pretty good. Uh, the political crisis really ended in 2015-16, uh, when the Syriza government accepted a third memorandum and took a lot of heat out of the political debate. Um, Greece has since then done all it needed to do to satisfy the international community. Um, and things look okay. I mean, this is, um, you know, no one is having a brilliant time economically at the moment, but Greece looks, uh, looks okay to me. So I'm, uh, I'm reasonably optimistic. How about you? Do, you? do you follow the economy close enough to, to get some sense of how things are going? No, I was, I was just, just very interested in, you know, the current state of Greece and how it's undergone, you know, complete restructuring of its welfare system. And due to the, like, if, um, due to the EU influence, the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, those are good points. I mean, it was really brutal in Greece. I mean, they uh, were required by the Troika and under the Memoranda of Understanding to uh, make in six or seven years the sorts of changes that Tory governments made in the UK um, over you know, 15, 20 years. They had a huge burden of uh, supply side reform, big macroeconomic reform, and it was, it was a tall order and actually wasn't always very well designed. The in international institutions now sound rather humbler about what they asked Greece to do because it wasn't always possible. Uh, for Greece or anybody else to take on such a huge restructuring burden. Um, but I, I do think um, from what I read, from what the experts are saying, that the basics have uh, been done well and are in place. And uh, now Greece needs um, you know, a bit of 
uh, international luck, uh, which none of us seems to be having at the moment, um, together with um, carefully working through its plans to attract investors, to bring talented Greeks back from uh, the overseas diaspora where they emigrated in large numbers from 2008 onwards. But let's be optimistic. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much for that. Um, and I think that question brings to a close um, our questions this evening. I'm sure you'll all agree it's been a, a fantastic hour um, of hearing not only reflections on a career, but plenty of very positive things said about classics. So thank you for that. Um, I hope that uh, those of you who are present this evening um, will attend future events of this kind. I know that we've got some classics ones um, lined up for the coming months. And I know that Emma and the development team at MTs will, will keep you posted on those. Um, but I think it just leaves me to say for one very final time, um, John Kitmer, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for being with us at Merchant Taylor School this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure for me too. Thank you. Good night.